I'm here to talk about Break It Down, or as the conference zeitgeist uh, would have it, the service oriented safari. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm friends with Joe O'Brien, who runs Edge Case. And the first time I gave a talk on this sort of topic, he came to me afterwards and said, we have to talk. Because four or five years ago, I think it was at the first RailsConf, I got up after uh, David Hansen had his you know, profanity slide and gave a talk about SLA and Rails, and I was virtually laughed out of the room. Uh, and what's happened is uh, that Joe saw, and a lot of us have seen, is that we're sort of coming back around to this approach of, of essentially service-oriented architecture. Um, and it's no longer the, the sort of bad word uh, that's associated with enterprise and all that stuff that, that it once was. So I, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, first, the mandatory, I work for Living Social, equal time, we're also hiring. So, uh, so, so if you're interested, you get in touch with me. Um, but, but with that out of the way, uh, well, let's do some science or something kind of science-like. So the first question, I think, is why should we even care about services in, in our Rails environment? Uh, we're, we're used to building in a certain way, where everything's sort of slapped together. And, and it's worked, right? We have, we have huge applications and very successful businesses built on the, these principles. So uh, here's a series of five dates. Who can tell me what these dates are? Anybody? Uh, Who can tell me what happened on these dates as opposed to what they actually are? <laughs> Your mother has five birthdays? <laughs> that is awesome. All right, I would have spaced them out a little better. Um, yeah, so Rails 1.0, Rails 2.0, Rails 2.3, Rails 3, and Rails 3.1. Now, uh, I did some uh, not at all research and found that when Rails 1 was released, there was one legacy app in Rails. It was called Basecamp. Uh, by the time Rails 2 came out, there were 200 legacy apps, uh, all the way up to now where we have way more than 25,000 apps that are essentially legacy in Rails. And what happened is more people started building, and when you build, you create legacy code, right? And Noel can tell us about testing it. Um, but over time, everything becomes like So in fact, most apps, I would say every app is legacy. And as legacy apps get bigger and bigger, uh, you run into uh, the big ball of mud, right? which no matter how much you polish it, hey, do you guys know this? This is awesome. You should look up pictures of it and videos of it. It's, it's a trend in Japan, I guess, called Duradango, where they take a ball of mud and they polish it until it's this gorgeous, shining jewel of a ball. And they did it on Mythbusters, but not with mud. Um, that, that, it turns out you can polish a turd. Um, and it, it's, it, as, as beautiful as the results of this practice are, it's a lot of work, and it's still a ball of mud. Right? So I think what we see is that there's a tendency for things to get bigger, and more stuff gets bolted on, and as we allow apps to grow organically, they just yeah, I always think of Job of the Hut when I think of this, right? It's like this giant blob sitting there, and it does stuff, right? It yanks on chains, and it sentences people to, to be frozen in carbonite. Um, but they just keep getting bigger. And I, I, you know, like Robo says, I don't even know why we have the square cube law if things can just get bigger infinitely. So, so what I want to do is point out that there's a different way, right? And it's thinking small, right? And if the big organic growth blob thing is one approach, then we could also look at it the exact opposite, where we have lots of little things that all work together, right? And the reason we should bother is because small things are easier to design, right? It's way easier to plan out the application that only does one tiny thing, right? It's only for user authentication than the application that does 50 different things. They're certainly easier to build, right? Yeah. When you have 18 different things going on, or 50 different things will be my number for this talk, I guess. 50 different things going on, you've got 50 different interacting processes that can all interfere with your build. Okay. They're easier to test. Um, big code is hard to test. Little code is easy to test. Look at methods alone. Unit testing a big method is always going to be harder than unit testing a two-line method, right? Debugging, if you've ever had a problem occur, some random spot, the smaller the, the pool that you're looking in, the easier that's going to be fine, right? So I was working at, on an app at a consulting agency um, about two years ago, and it took us three days to find why purchases couldn't go through. 
when if purchases had been separated out with their own application, we would have known instantly, right? You just zero in on it. They're easier to scale because they're only doing one thing, right? Um, why is it easier to scale an application when your database is on one box and your application servers are on another than when they're on the same box? Because right? they're separate, right? You can just add more database boxes. You've already got that interface there, and it's easier to spread it out to multiple than when it's all one chunk. They're easier to replace. So if you find out that somebody has been building a better video encoding site than you were building for yourself, then you can just slap in their solution instead of your own. And they're easier to reuse. So you can actually, if you have built authentication as a separate app using, you've got your own OAuth service provider or something, then you can use it to provide authentication to all of your apps instead of having to build that each and every time. And you can also sell it for yourself. Right? The Heroku add-on catalog is a great place to go to look for, um, I used to work for Heroku, so sort of, sideways plug for the Heroku add-on catalog. But uh, there are tons of services there that people have built that you can reuse because they built them as tiny, single function applications. So, so hopefully that, that's you know, at least indicative of why you might want to think small. But if you're looking at your giant ball of mud, your drop of the hut, your 50 different things happening in one app, there's a, a real question about how do you start? How do you split something off? Because uh, I think we saw, it was it, it wasn't Zach's presentation, but it was an earlier one. With the, the, as coupling goes up, the pain to, to test and the pain to do anything with goes up, right? If everything is sort of intermingled, it's hard to see where to start on yanking something out and making it its own service. So the, the natural question is, what should I do, right? And the, the overall answer is, follow the single responsibility principle. Apps, just like other units of code, should do one thing. And when you're talking about a method, the one thing they're doing is very, very small. When you're talking about a library, the one thing might be bigger. So it might be a method might pluralize uh, a string. A library might provide all kinds of inflections, but it just provides inflections on strings, right? When you get an app, there's, it should still do one thing, but the thing is going to be bigger. So it might be authentication. It might be semantic analysis. It might be any number of things that we'll see in a minute. It might be walking if your likes have been split off into a separate application. But there are, the, the key is to find that one thing, right? So if your app does 50 different things, that's potentially 50 different apps. So here are some good places to start. Uh, I've already talked about authentication, and OAuth is, I think, the sort of banner child for this, right? If you want to provide an OAuth service from your platform, then split it off into its own application to provide that, and then you know, farm it back into your app and give it to other people as well. Uh, administration, right? There's no reason that the administration <laughs> interface needs to be the same actual app code base that your, your end user is looking at, right? And in fact, you're, you're slightly more secure if they're not the same because there's no chance that the user will stumble on it in the course of their action. Reporting, as data gets bigger, the demands it places upon your application and your code Get, they get more onerous, right? So imagine running you know, gigs of reports on the same server through the same code base that you're serving hundreds of millions of hits a day on. It's, it's never going to work. Search is one that I go back and forth on. There are a couple of, and the reason I include it is because there are people who are doing it, right? You can get search as a service now uh, with, with uh, Thinking Sphinx, uh, or Flying Sphinx, I guess. Um, there was Index Tank, which recently got acquired. There are other options where you send out the data to be indexed, and then you send searches to that service and get it back. Right? So it, it is something, again, that's computationally intensive. That maybe it's not your core competency. You just need to provide it, something you can split out. Payments. Who here has written their own payment processor? Who did it when they were not working for a payment processing company? I'm sorry to those of you who read your head, because I'm sure that was not an enjoyable experience. Um, for some domains, the sheer pain of dealing with legal requirements and logistical requirements, well, it makes it not practical to do it in your app. Right? There's no reason that you should have to deal with payment in your app. And uh, another reason to separate certain things like this out, when there are legal requirements on a domain, including them as part of the big ball of mud, can impose those legal requirements in a larger context. For example, if you have to be PCI compliant, you actually have to have the, the trusted developer, shitty developer divide that, that Zach 
you know, uh, add upon earlier. Um, because not everybody can commit if you're PCI compliant. As you bring on new people, they, they just, they're legally not allowed to. Um, close to my heart, which is why we're kind of living social, is email. Right? There's no reason email needs to be part of your app. You, your app is most likely doing something on the web. Email is a separate communication channel. Farm that out. Right? There are dozens of email service providers out. Uh, eye contact, uh, contactology, contact email service provider, MailChimp, you know, all of them that, that will happily handle this for you, or you can write your own if it's something that you need to. But it doesn't need to be part of your app. And I think what a lot of these, these domains have in common is that there are different indicators that point you and say, look at this as something possible to extract, right? So the, the first one that I noticed was I started working on an app that had seven or eight different namespaced routes in the routes file. So the routes file was huge. And they were split up into all these different namespaces. There was admin, there was a uh, thing that is redacted so that you don't know what app this was, and another thing that was redacted so that you don't. Um, each one of those should have, in fact, been its own application. Right? The namespace was like the, the flag waving, saying, hey, extract me. I don't need, I'm, I'm already separated. I need to be more separate. Users are another place. So if the audience that's using a particular set of functionality is, is well defined, that might very well be a, a place to split it out. So uh, something like LexisNexis, which is mostly used by academics, as it, as it becomes more public and non-academics use it, they're going to have different needs. And so it can make sense to split out their functionality into a separate code base um, so that they're not you don't give them the same functionality because they don't need the same functionality. As teams grow, so as applications grow, teams usually grow too, right? So at, at Living Social, we have something like 60 developers now. Um, we can't obviously all work on the same code at the same time. That, that's a lot of people to be working on one thing. Um, so we have split up into teams. And at a certain point, it can make sense to have those teams work on separate applications just instead of separate parts of the code base, right? So we have a merchants team. We have a payments team, we have my email team, we have uh, the consumer web team, we have internal applications, all of these, uh, there's no reason for them to be working on the same code at all. Right? We don't touch the same code, uh, and when we do, those things are generally better split out into gems and other things that are shared. Um, or you can have teams that come together to form giant robots later. Vendors, I've already mentioned looking at uh, services that are offered for sale as an option. Um, if you're not sure whether you can split out an, a, a sort of application, a single responsibility into its own application, chances are somebody's already done it and they're charging money for it. So there's no reason you can't. And then if you need to reuse something, so, so this is kind of once you've already started, right? You've already got like three apps and you're seeing duplicate code between them. That's a time to think about splitting your app. And this is where authentication comes up, right? Because every app we write has authentication. Maybe we shouldn't be writing it 12 different times for 12 different apps. But, but the real lesson is that for any situation, you're the person who knows your domain. You're the person who knows what's big enough or small enough to be a single responsibility for a full application. So you make the rules. Um, maybe for me, like six different apps make sense. Maybe for you, you know, one hole blasted through the middle by Carl Sagan with a lightning gun uh, makes sense. But it, but it really is, it, it's up to what fits your needs. Like I, I mentioned for small units of code, this, the single responsibility is very small. For, as you get larger, right, that's all subjective. And it depends on what you're doing with the code and what you're doing with the application. So how do you go about doing it, right? If, you, if you've sort of got an idea of, I'm looking at my application, and clearly administration doesn't belong to anything else. As a whole separate set of controllers, it hits different models in some cases, there's a different authentication system for it, I'm gonna split it out. What do I do? Uh, or how do I do it? Um, I think the first thing to realize is that you already are splitting it out. If, if you look at, well, we've already split out authentication in a number of different places. Uh, a lot of people already have payments split out if you're paying for any service, and who here is using something as a service provided by somebody else in their application? Okay, that's actually smaller than I would expect. But um, we're already doing it, right? We already have sort of models. So, so you ask the question, how did you do those? 
And I think the first step is testing, right? So when you're looking at your big ball of mud, hopefully you have a nice test suite that, that sort of exercises the full path. Uh, taking an authentication example, right? It's, you see a login form, you submit some stuff, comes back, maybe using Cucumber, maybe using Rails integration tests, doesn't really matter. The first step is that you have a test suite that exercises the path that's gonna hit all of the applications you're worried about. Okay? Once you have that, you're able to, to isolate the code that you're looking to separate, right? So you don't, you don't go ahead and do Rails new over here immediately. Instead, you make sure that you separate using um, namespacing at the module level, uh, using APIs, using internal communication tools uh, to make sure that the code isn't coupled anymore, that it's not calling into the, the code that you want to replace. Um, once you do that, you test again to make sure that the test suite still passes, and then you can go and replace it, right? So if I've got authentication, let, let's use like the standard uh, authentication that everybody has always done in, in Rails, where I hit sessions new, and that does a user dot find by password or whatever, and, it, and then it checks the hash, uh, find by email, checks the hash passwords, um, and then it returns authenticated, set session, whatever, right? The first step for isolating is you move that out and you say user.authenticate pass in the params, right? So you've already isolated the, the internals of the find by into the model. Then once you've done that, you can pull out user.authenticate from the model and replace it with a service call into your, your authentication service and make sure that it returns the same thing. You run your tests again and they pass and that's, that's it, right? It, I kind of feel bad about proposing this talk because it's not actually a hard process, right? It's test, isolate, replace, repeat, right? And that, that really is all there is to it. Um, uh, who here has an application that they need to replace a part of with a service? What's, what's the part? Email. Email. Okay, so how are you sending email now? Through a third party. Through a third party? Okay, so you've actually, so if we're gonna replace email being sent through a third party, you've already got some of this stuff, right? You, uh, hopefully you already have a test suite that exercises the, the connection to the service provider. Yeah, so if you're looking, are you looking to bring it in-house or to another provider? More, more options. More options? You want more messaging options. So you need to build, right now you have a certain sort of layer in between your application and the, the email service provider. So you need to support your extra options in that layer and then find the appropriate provider that can read them, right? So you have your test suite, you add the options here, you run the test suite, the old provider still doesn't meet them, you replace it, and then you run the test suite and it meets them, I guess. Yeah, that's an interesting case of replacing one already service with another already service. Anybody else? Okay. So problems, th this is not sort of the panacea, right? I w if you're writing Sinatra apps and deploying them on the free planet of Roku, you probably don't need to do this. Um, uh, if you're writing giant evil computers that vent steam instead of just looking like little boxes, you probably don't need to do this either. But there are some, some real issues with service oriented architectures that you need to be aware of. The first one, obviously, is latency. Actually, this might not even be the first obvious one, but it is an obvious one. When you're talking about services, there are risks inherent in having them not be part of the same application, not be part on the same box, not be in the same data center. And the, the ways to get around the latency issue are with monitoring and defensive coding. Right? So you can't guarantee you're going to know where your app's going to run. So you need to be aware of what's happening, and you need to code it in such a way that it handles interruptions. Um, at one point, I think Amazon was running a couple dozen services to populate its homepage. And if any one of them did not return a response in some sub half of a second time frame, uh, that little module would just be dropped out. And the page was designed such that if any piece didn't return in time, it still made sense. Okay. If all of them failed, it wouldn't work. But if only one of them failed, it, it's fine. Uh, the same thing goes for reliability, right? Our applications fail, right? We're imperfect developers. It, it just happens. And so when you multiply the number of applications, you're multiplying the number of opportunities for failure. Again, uh, defensive coding and monitoring are really important for this, right? You want to know as soon as it happens so that you can fix it. Uh, you want 
to be as fault tolerant as you can be. But then integration testing is, is the other piece here, right? Um, you guys know the Chaos Monkey from Netflix, which is a, a series of processes now. It's multiplied, and it's like a Chaos Monkey family um, that, that essentially goes in and breaks stuff at random. I think they do it in production, which is crazy, but it is what it is. Right, so they had the original Chaos Monkey would just like throw out network connect. It would roam around their boxes. It's not an actual monkey, right? It's just a process. <laughs> but it, it would simulate like monkeys yanking Ethernet cables out of boxes in their, in their data center. And they would they have monitoring all the time so they can see when this happened and how they, they're, they responded to it, right? We can simulate that without, again, actual monkeys with integration testing, right? So uh, you can integration test the normal path and you can integration integration test the, the failed path by mocking out your service and having it return something bad. Right? Complexity is an issue that I think uh, services are kind of new to Rails in general. Uh, I think that we don't appreciate the complexity downside of them as much as we might, uh, might need to. And where I see this happening most often is in development. Right? So at work now, I have to run five different applications to get the full user experience of using my production site. Right? I have to run them on my box. Not counting services like Memcache and Redis and things like that. Um, and one of the ways to deal with this is a tool called Foreman, which came from Heroku. Uh, it's a gem that gives you a proc file where you define certain processes and then you, so like web is Rails server and uh, Red, uh, rescue is like whatever and you know Memcache is Memcache D start. You type form and start, it reads the proc file and starts all those processes for you. So what I have is in, in my root directory, I go form and start, and it descends into each of the applications that I have to run, it reads their proc files, and starts all the services that I need. So instead of having to do Rails start or Rails server in a bunch of different places, and Redis start and, and all that, uh, I have one command, it starts all my, all my applications that I need for a complete experience, uh, and I don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, the other way to deal with complexity is specialization. So I, I say I have to run five different apps locally to, to replicate the full production experience. As the team lead for mail, I don't actually care about the full production experience. I care about email. So I generally just run one app, um, and I'm, I'm specialized into that app. Uh, other people generally just run the mail tracker app or, or the consumer web app or whatever it happens to be. Right? They run the one app they need to. So specialization is a way to reduce complexity at the individual developer as well. And then the, the last major problem with this is, is redundancy. Right? And we've had, don't repeat yourself, drilled into our heads uh, time and time again. And I, when you start splitting things out into services, you're going to be repeating yourself, right? You're, if you're building a bunch of rail services or a bunch of Sinatra services or whatever, you, you're at least repeating the framework code. Chances are you're repeating a lot of the internal code as well. And the ways to get around that are, are code review uh, to see where the repetition is happening. Use automated tools. I think. Uh, is it, it's not flawed, Flay, does that do the code duplication checks? No? Yes. Uh, yes, okay, so Flay and other tools can be used to find repeated sections of code, uh, and then you know, more extraction, right? You pull out more services, you pull out gems. You, this is a way, this is sort of don't repeat yourself writ large, right? So when everything's in a single application, you're kind of repeating everything uh, the whole way. You've got code being used in multiple places when it shouldn't be. When you split that out, you have to reduce that duplication again. Uh, so to recap, um, you should buy Atomic Robo, which is the comic that these images have come from and is amazing, uh, available at finer comic stores uh, nationwide, hopefully worldwide. Um, but also, Look at your application. If it's turning into a big ball of mud, or if it isn't, if it's just getting big, think about the ways in which you can split it up. Um, it's not always going to make sense, certainly. But it's not something that we should dismiss out of hand as we have for the past you know, five years of the Rails community. It's, the more success we see as application developers, the bigger things we're going to be building, and the more mature and varied our approaches to building those things is going to have to be. Uh, Questions? Uh, so you used, you used admin as an example, uh, uh -huh. and that's one where I could see you would actually want to share, especially a lot of the data model between the two. How do you tackle sharing data model between two separate apps? Okay, 
So the question is, uh, having used administration as an example of this, uh, obviously you're going to be sharing the data model to some extent between the two. How do you tackle that? Right? Yeah. Okay, so the data model is rarely identical between admin and the user, for one. Right? Uh, so at a certain level, there's not going to be that much duplication. You are going to have, for instance, models named pretty much the same thing in both. Um, that, I don't, I, I don't know how harmful that is. Um, you could, if you wanted to, go sort of crazy with this, which is probably a degree to which I would not recommend, you could extract the, the model layer itself into a gem or into an engine, um, the, the common stuff, and include that in both apps, and then just have things that sit on top of them that are, uh, that are the specializations required for each piece. Um, but I don't know when that would be recommended. Never? Never that would be recommended. Okay. Never do that. Uh, yes? So I don't know about never. At, uh, <laughs> back end of yellowpages.com, we used to use, we have, there's a service layer there that does just that because all of those back end business models get used by native iPhone right. apps. They get used by four or five different websites. Right. Um, the back end Oracle databases and search engines are all abstracted. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's a service layer that's used by a bunch of different apps and okay. is completely separate. So, so that's actually the, uh, I, I, I actually had this in an earlier version of the talk and I completely forgot about it. Um, so making the model layer a service layer of its own is an option, right? And that actually isn't, I, that doesn't contrast with the never because the never was actually uh, crazy like gemifying your model layer and including it or repeating code, right? So, so service layering it, the data layer is, Definitely an option, and as you look at, um, I think we don't often think about because we're used to using relational databases. But as you start looking at object databases and graph databases and things, those actually make a data layer, a data service layer, a little more natural of a step. Was there a question over here in the corner? Ew. Question over here. Okay, I think that does it. And thank you.